<clears throat> this is Thursday, June 11, 2015. We are at the Museum of World War II Boston, and this tape is part of the ongoing Veterans Oral History Project based at the Morse Institute Library in partnership with Natick Pegasus in Natick, Massachusetts. My name is Maureen Sullivan. We are privileged to have with us today Izzy Arbeiter. Welcome, Izzy. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? I was born on April 25th, 1925. And where were you born? In Poland, in a city called Plotsk, P-L-O-C-K. And where is Plotsk? Plotsk is located uh, 90 kilometers from the German border of East Prussia and about 120 kilometers from Warsaw. What town do you currently live in? I live in Newton, Massachusetts. Your marital status? I am married. Do you have children? Yes, I have three children, three grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren. Mm. Tell us what Plosk, Poland was like growing up. Uh, Plotsk, uh, growing up in Poland and Plotsk for a Jewish boy, of course, I attended school, public school, and uh, Hebrew school. And what did your father do for a living? My father was a tailor, um, custom tailor, made custom clothes for his customers. And your mother? My mother was uh, a housewife. She was busy bringing up five boys. While you were growing up in Poland, before the Nazis came to power, uh, did you, you or your family experience any discrimination? Yes. And can you tell us a little more about that? Well, anti-Semitism in Poland, even before the war, was very strong. Uh, number one, it was supported uh, by the government and by the church. I attended to school. It was a separate, equal but separate. There were, uh, not all over the country, in certain cities, in the city of Plotsk where I was living, uh, there was a, a schools, public schools for Jewish uh, children and public school for uh, Polish children. What kind of discrimination did you experience at that period? Uh, very high discrimination. Uh, um, for instance, being a boy, um, a youngster, uh, less than 10 years old, maybe seven, uh, six, seven, eight years old, in the neighborhood were living uh, also Gentile people. Polish people and we played together and when it came before uh, Passover uh, the Polish boys would say uh, we can't play with you now we gotta go home we gotta go home because the Jews are killing Polish children and use their blood for matzah. That's what they told you? That's what they told me. Even worse they called me, if we had an argument, they would call me, you're a Jew, uh, you're a, a, chai, a Christ killer, a Christ killer. I used to go home and I, I was crying and I asked my mother, who, I didn't kill anybody, who is, who is Christ? And I was a youngster, I didn't know anything. But uh, uh, that's what I was called, a, a, a Christ killer. killer. We were, um, Officially, uh, say, um, it was a religious town. Come Friday afternoon, everything came to a standstill in the Jewish section. There was a Jewish section. Everything came to a standstill. Uh, the, the stores were closed. Uh, my father stopped working. All the shops stopped working. And, um, and it was the Sabbath. 
The next day was a holiday. Everything was closed. We used to go, Plotsk was high above the river Visla. And there was a nice parks. So on, on the Sabbath, we used to go, there was no a television, uh, there was no car. So we used to walk down the family Saturday on the Sabbath to the parks. Um, the uh, Polish uh, kids, or, or a little older than just kids, would attack us and chase us out of the park. And there were fights every day. And when the police came, they used to say, if our children want you to come here, then don't come, then go someplace else. Uh, on, the, on Saturday, uh, the main uh, sport activities were soccer, soccer games. And so there was, a, so every Saturday was a soccer game. Uh, so of course that was part of the Saturday uh, uh, entertainment. And so everybody went to the, uh, to the soccer game. We had to leave the game right after halftime because at the end of the game, uh, well, I say not kids, but grown-ups were waiting outside the stadium for us in attacking the Jewish people, throwing stones, attacking with, uh, with sticks. So it was a terrible thing. Every, every Saturday was the same thing I repeat. And we had a prime minister by the name of Sklatkowski. And he would say, kill Jews, I will not allow. But an economic war, yes. And so we had uh, uh, big, strong men, Poles, wearing armbands, red armbands, and they were staying in front of, of Jewish stores. And I don't mean in the front of the street, right on the steps and the door. And they would stay like this and would not allow Gentiles to buy in the Jewish stores. And you had signs that they were carrying, don't buy from Jews, don't do business with Jews. Uh, and so there was anti-Semitism wherever, in every street and every, wherever, wherever you went. In most, in the part of life was anti-Semitism. So you lived with anti-Semitism from an early age. Yes. Tell us uh, what was happening when, while you were growing up and going to school. Were you made aware of like the Nazis in Germany or what was happening in your part of Europe at that time? Yes, we started, it started in the 30s. Don't forget uh, when the war broke out in 1939, I was 14 years old. Uh, so before that, but uh, I was a youngster, but we still knew what was going on in Germany. Did you have any kind of job when you were 14? Uh, yes, I start my time, my father was a tailor. And so I, living in the house, I would help, you know, watch my father, what he was doing. But the prime thing was to get an education, which was interrupted at the age of 14. Tell us what happened next, Izzy. Starting in 1939. Yes. Uh, September 1st, 1939, World War II broke out. Germany attacked Poland. Uh, being 90 kilometers from the German border, it took the Germans three days to enter the city of Plotsk. So they, they entered the city of Plotsk on the 3rd of September right behind the frontline troops, which were called the Wehrmacht, were the occupation forces, consisting of the Gestapo, um, different uh, police units, uh, and the SS. With them, they brought the uh, Nuremberg laws, which would deprive us of our civil rights. So now we had no protection, we had no civil rights.
we were not allowed to own anything like uh, property, uh, businesses, um, a ghetto was established when, when all the Jewish people living in the city of Plotsk were ordered to move into the ghetto, which was a, the Jewish section of the city. Um, then they were bringing on in people from the nearby villages or small towns. Um, My family, my father, my family was a called a middle class. But still in the middle class, our our apartment we were five boys and my parents, or were seven people. We were living in a two room apartment. So one room was the first room was the, the kitchen, my father's tailor shop, uh, and the dining room where we were eating. Then the next room was the bedroom, the reception that my father was dealing with, with customers, and if, um, and if company came. So at night, there were seven people sleeping in this one in this one room. At this time, were you getting enough to eat? Um, yes, we had enough to eat. Nothing. Oh, you're talking now about the uh, ghetto. Right. Uh, no. In the ghetto, food was uh, rationed. As soon as we uh, were placed in the ghetto, food was rationed. And certain things were completely taken off of the, off the ration cards. A ration card was given only to a person that registered for work. In the ghetto, the Germans set up a uh, Jewish committee that were running the inside of the ghetto. Uh, in order to get a uh, ration card, you had to register for work. What was the work? Something was a little important, some was not important. It was just to uh, discriminate, to, to, to make us look bad. Like uh, cleaning, washing the streets. Uh, people were getting buckets with water, with brushes, and they had to scrub uh, the streets. Some were for the uh, Germans, for the SS, and for the police units, whatever the Germans was, was needed, what they wanted. But in the in mostly it was not needed it's just to keep us to be discriminated um, food was getting less and less uh, the rations were getting smaller and smaller so Myself and two of my brothers were registered to go to work so that we can get lame, uh, 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 the card, the ration card. We didn't want our father to go to work to be because he was already a little uh, elderly. So we went to work and um, to be able to get the ration card and thereby bring home a little food that we can eat. And what kind of food uh, were you allowed to have? Bread, potatoes, but also not as much as we wanted. It was rationed. Um, food products, which is potatoes, uh, I'm trying to think. To in English, out there, roasted or carrots, uh, things of that nature. But the sugar, food, uh, meat was off the ration card for us. 
And so that's what we were eating. If we, if we brought home, if, we brought, if I brought home, let's say, on my ration card, a loaf of bread, that was already, that was full. And if we had potatoes, my mother would cook up a pot of potatoes and um, bread, and uh, you weren't fussy what you put in your stomach, as long as you can put something in your stomach. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you registered for work. What kind of work did you do? I was assigned to work for a police unit. And what did you do? I uh, had to come in the morning, and shine the officer's boots, clean the room. In the winter, bring in, uh, there was no central heating. There were ovens, a coal and wood to bring in uh, the coal and wood to the rooms to heat the, the rooms and any other labor things that, uh, that they wanted me to do. How did the officers treat you, the police unit? Well, this was, this was 1939. There were, there were some very bad ones but there were also some that were not in so much in anti-Semitism or the, in the final solution, which is not in, enacted yet, so that they treat us fairly good. But some were uh, uh, hardcore Nazis, and there were just, if you were a Nazi, if you were a Jew, you uh, did not have to be treated humanely. While you were living in the ghetto, were you receiving any news of what was happening, uh, say, with the Germans or uh, in Europe at that time? Um, there was no radio, there was no newspapers, but there were in the cities were what's called kiosk, and they had what the, whatever the Germans put out on that kiosk. So there was a group of people every day staying there and lead, reading what's, what news the Germans wanted us to know. Such as victories in France and? Yes. The, uh, you know, everything, the greatness about Hitler and the greatness about the Nazi party and, uh, and German is moving forward and this sort of, they're already here, they're already there. All right, Izzy, uh, you're about 14, 15 years old. How long were uh, you, you and your family living in the ghetto? Plotsk was, like I said, 90 kilometers from the German border. So in 1940, that part of Poland was incorporated. You know, Poland was divided between the Germans the Russians in the central government in around Warsaw, which was the central government, but it was a, under the influence of the Germans. They had to do whatever the Germans wanted to do. So in 1940, that part of Germany where we were living was incorporated into the Third Reich. And therefore, it was declared a uh, Judenrein or free of Jews. And so now, one night, 1941, February of 1941, in the middle of the night, without a prior warning, SS units came in into the ghetto and ordered everybody out from their ho ho homes and assembled at the center of the ghetto. Imagine now, Families that living there for generations had 15 minutes to leave everything behind, everything that was in their families for generations and uh, whatever anybody possessed. What can you take in 15 minutes with you? You first you grab whatever you can, a loaf of bread, some food, and everything else now you don't own anything anymore just whatever you could put on, on your back and what you can take, grab. 
We were assembled in the, in the center of the ghetto and transported from there in trucks to East Prussia and placed there in a camp called Soldau. And can you spell that, please? Soldau, S-O-L, the uh, the A-U, so down. We were there a short time. It was a, it was a transit camp. Uh, we were there a short time, maybe a, a week or two. And then from there, we were uh, transported by in kettle cars into deep, uh, into Poland, into a place called uh, Starachowice. There in Sarachowice was already a ghetto. We were placed in that ghetto. Now that area was a very poor part of Poland. So most of the people in that ghetto, which already, which was already overcrowded, some people were living only in one or in two rooms. And so again, those that were living in two rooms had to give up one room for the people from Plotsk. So we were giving a room uh, with a, a people that were, that we were, that there were also seven people in that family. They took everything out from that room and just left a little straw on the, on the, on the floor. And this was our quarters and that's where we were living. And how big was that room? Not too big. How, how big can I say? And you had 14 people in two rooms. In two rooms. The worst part of it was, the worst part of it was, I mean, we could get by sleeping on the floor on straw. We could get by again on the ration that we are, were receiving. Again, we had the register for work so we can get the uh, ration card. The worst thing was in you as a woman were would appreciate that two women, strangers, that never met before, one that was forced in the house of the other one, using the same kitchen. Oh dear. Can you, can you imagine that? Not only the 14 people that were living in the, in the two rooms, but the two women sharing the same kitchen. That was the worst part, because not only was the pressure on the family, but the terrible pressure on my mother, that she had to go through every day, even when she wanted to heat up a little water so we can have a little warm tea or something. There was always one was in the other in the way of the other. That was 1941. At the beginning, and of course, I was assigned there to work uh, for the Gestapo. Yeah, I'm sure you know what the Gestapo is. Again, my job there was, I had to come in the morning, uh, shine the officers' boots, they put out the boots in front of their of their rooms, and so I had to come polish their boots so when they get up so that they will have shine the boots. There were two cars, uh, two cars there. I, every day I had to wash the cars, clean the cars. Um, in the summer, I had to work in the garden. They had a garden where we were planting uh, potatoes and other things. In the winter again, I had to heat the ovens in the offices so that they would, and in their rooms, when they went out from the rooms, I had to go in and clean out the ovens and prepare a hall of wood and, and, and coals and to heat, to heat the rooms. And any other things that needed to be done there on the premises. I was mistreated, I was beaten, um, Although I was a youngster and I was crying, I was assigned on the job by the Jewish committee. So I went back to the Jewish committee 
and I cried and I said, I'm being mistreated and I'm being beaten. Please send me to another job. The main workplace in Starovice was there was an ammunition factory that was belonging before to the Polish government. Now the German was running it, of course, for their military. So I asked to be transferred, and they sent me to work now in the ammunition factory, where I was working in a department producing artillery shells. You can imagine my feeling, the way I'm being treated, and that everything is, is against me, and I'm here, I'm helping the Germans producing from them ammunition for them. But that's what it was. But we were done in 1942, in October of 1942. Uh, you know, at the beginning of 42, there was the uh, Van Zee conference. You know, the conference in Berlin in the Villa of Van Zee, where I, uh, under the uh, direction of Heinrich, a group of German officers and government officials met in the villa and to work out on orders from Himmler to work out a plan for the final solution of the Jewish question, of the Jewish problem, of the Jewish question. And so they came up after a few days there of drinking and then what I call a bunch of drunken assessment worked out a plan for the extermination of the Jewish people. First, those that are now under the uh, German occupation, and then any other areas that the German army will come under, the area will come under German control, will also be exterminated. And so in the middle of the night, without uh, prior warning, there was a special unit called the Einsatzgruppen, or the, uh, a special unit that was traveling in the ghettos and in the towns and uh, uh, sending out the Jews to, the, to, the, to be exterminated. In the middle of the night, uh, the unit came into Starovice. We were ordered to assemble in the marketplace again whatever we had, nothing again. And now there was a selection where uh, young people, men and women, that according to Germans were capable of performing slave labor, placed on one side, the very young and the elder on the other side. Uh, my mother, my father, and my seven-year-old brother were placed on one side, and myself and two of my brothers placed on the other line, which were supposed to be, which we didn't know at that time what it is. I was a teenager. I was never away from my family. It wasn't in Poland that you, as a teenager, you could travel all over the country or all over the world. And so I was never away from my parents. And I didn't want to be separated at this time either. So at the risk of, of, of uh, life, that you could have been killed for it, I ran back to the line where my parents were. And I said, I want to be with my parents. Whatever happened to them, let happen to me. But we got to be together. My father at that time realized what's happening here. And he said to me and the two of my brothers, go black, he said, children, go back on the other line. And remember, try and save your, uh, uh, thrive yourself. And if you'll survive, remember to carry on with Jewish life and Jewish tradition. Uh, that was And, st and still is the darkest day of my life. Because 
those were the last words I heard from my father. My father, my mother, and my seven-year-old brother were taken away from there, taken to a death camp in Treblinka, and they are murdered. I'm sorry. No, please. <laughs> Myself and two of my brothers were sent into a slave labor camp in the town of Starovice. And we were assigned to work in the ammunition factory. That winter of 1942, 42, 43, due to the hygienic, the hygienic uh, situation the camp was so bad and the food was so bad uh, we got a shower a, a cold shower once if we're lucky once in six months or once a year so because of that and the epidemic of typhus broke out we had a camp commandant by the name of Arkov, which I believe even now that he was not a human being. Because no human being could commit such atrocities on other human beings as he did. His greatest pleasure was to shoot people for no reason at all. And so whenever a group of people were placed in that quarantine, whoever got sick of typhus, was placed in that quarantine. And whenever Alpha felt like, he would take the, out those people into the nearby forest and shut them there. It so happened that I also was afflicted with the with typhus, and I was placed in the quarantine. I was very sick. Uh, of course, when you were there, the German policy was if you couldn't work, you didn't get any food because food was only for those that can work. We were condemned to death anyways, we got, but we, they only, we could only live, they only let us live for as long as we could work, as long as we could do, could do slave labor. I was placed in the quarantine with the others, there were 87 people in that quarantine. In the middle of the night, the lights were on, and they heard the screaming, everybody out, everybody out. And as people were running out through the door, uh, the camp commandant Altov and the chief of the Gestapo by the name of Walter Becker were staying there and shooting people as they were coming out of the door. Out of the 87 people that were there that night, 86 people were murdered that night. Only one escaped, came out alive. And that's me. How did you escape? It's a story. It's a very hard story. I'll be glad to have to tell you, if you want me to go into the detail of it. Go on. The barrack that we were in, number one, when we were placed in that camp, it was all barracks with people that could work. It was just getting, when people were getting sick, that they set up that uh, uh, quarantine which was Barak 5. The original Barak that I was placed before was Barak 3. That night, the, the Barak had on one side a door, and the back of the Barak were, were, was a window. And inside in the Barak were uh, bunks, three thicker bunks. 
uh, I was on the third day, on the third tier of the bank. When I hear that they are screaming everybody out, the day before I could not move. Now I don't know, and I still don't know, how I got that strength and the wisdom to act and to do the things that I was doing. I came down from the bank. I got the strength to come down. And as I stood in the aisle, looking towards the door, I could see what's happening, that everybody that's running out through the door is being shot there. So I said to myself, I'm not going there. If they want to kill me, let them come in and kill me here. But then I saw in back of me the door, I mean the window. And so I opened up the window and I said, if I can jump out through the window and get across on the other side where the barrack tree is where I come from, I, I might have a chance. Here is no chance. Here I'm going to get killed. So I opened up the window and I was trying to get out to jump out and there was somebody staying near the window, I presume an SS man because those were the guards. And he said, get back, get back or I'll shoot. And I said, don't shoot, don't shoot, I'm going back. I went back in, staying at the same place. I still not going towards the door. When people were not coming out anymore, there was still people that were laying in the banks that couldn't move. So they were coming in, into the camp and shooting the people that were laying in the banks. When I saw that happen, I said, I gotta take another chance. I opened up the window again, and I looked out, and that there was a human being there before. Why do I say human being? He could have still be there and stopped me from going out. He was not there. He, this is what I'm saying. He probably realized what's seeing, what's going on here, and saying, I don't want to be part of that. And he left his post. When I saw there's nobody there, I jumped out through the window. In the center of the camp, separating the two lines of the barracks, was a ditch. In the center of the camp was a tower with a guard. In, with a machine gun, and he had a searchlight. When I jumped out from the window, he hit me with the searchlight. And he yelled, get back, get back or I'll shoot. And I said to him, don't shoot, don't shoot, I'm going back. But the, the good part of it, the lucky part for me, that he was not staying on the searchlight on me, but he was circling around. When he took the searchlight off for me, I took a lip. I didn't run, I just took another leap. And when he came again with the searchlight on me, I was just laying still. Again, the same thing, until I get to that ditch, and then I threw myself in the ditch. He kept circling. I then climbed out on the other side of the ditch. There were still people in the barrack that saw me, what I did, and they were doing the same thing, running out. By then, uh, the uh, camp commandant and the chief of the Gestapo saw what's doing and they were shooting people as they were running out. Of course, they hit people because they were shown out of their own. In the meantime, I jumped out and, and ran to, the, to Barak Tree, but I didn't use the door because they could have seen. So I went around through the back, there was the window, and I knocked in the window. And my friends, I said, uh, who is here? And I, they opened up the window and they pulled me on, especially a friend of mine by the name of Jack Lyman, who put me under the straw, under his straw sack, and he put himself on top of the straw sack. After they killed everybody in the barrack and they were shooting the people that, uh, that were running, but I was ahead of them, so I was already around the, the barrack. And of course, by some, they were following the, whoever, if they hit somebody, they could see the blood marks, and they were following by the blood marks where they ran into which barrack, and they went there, they took them out and killed them. 
now they knew that maybe somebody else escaped. So they were going from barrack to barrack. <laughs> Each barrack had a, a lager, I mean a block eldest there, which was somebody that was in charge of the block. So they were going around in the blocks, in the barracks, and say there is, we know that there are some people that escaped from barrack five. We want, we're giving you 15 minutes. We'll be back. If there is somebody that is here in this barrack, we want you to deliver him to us. If you want to deliver him, and if we come in, and if you search the barrack, and we'll find somebody that's hiding here, this is what they said to the block illness. You'll be the first one to be shot, we'll kill the one that escaped, and we'll take 25 people at random out from the barrack and kill them. And that's what they were doing, going around all over the barracks. After they left, they left friends of mine under the leadership of uh, Jack Lyman, went down from their bunks to the, like, to the block, uh, his name was Guns, and said, look, today is the last day you're gonna die today. You know, today you're gonna die. He said, do you know, you heard what they said, they're gonna come back. And if you're gonna tell them that somebody's hiding here, that is the alibi that is hiding here, they'll take him out and they'll kill him. After they leave, we will kill you. However, if you, they come in and you tell them that nobody's hiding here and they'll search the barrack and they'll find him, they'll kill him, they'll kill you, and they'll kill 25 of us over here. So you have the once in a million chance. If when they come in and they ask whether somebody's hiding here, and if you will say no, and if they will search the barrack, and if they don't find him, then he will live and you will live. But that is one in a million chances. Because if they will go bunk by bunk, they will find them. Well, it's, they came in, as they promised, they came in, and they asked, is anybody hiding here? And the block elder says no. They started to search the barrack, they went through about half a barrack. I was at the very end of the barrack, and they stopped. They didn't go all the way. They were, maybe they were afraid that they might catch a typhus or, or whatever, nobody's there. So, or, or I say, when people ask me, how did all this happen, I says, I needed, I had protection from somebody very powerful, somebody that guided me, and it had to be God. Because he stopped them just before they came to my bank. They left the bank, and I fell asleep on the death straw set. My two brothers were working the night, the night shift. There were two, two shifts, the day shift and the night shift. Mine would have been the day shift. My brother was the night shift. So in the morning, they came back to the night shift. The morning shift started off when they came to the factory, to the ammunition factory. They said that everybody that was in barrack five was killed, nobody came out alive. And my brothers knew that, that, that I'm there. So here I am, I was sleeping. I fell asleep exhausted. And I hear my brother staying near the window and I hear him crying because he was told that everybody's killed there. And I woke up in bed and I said in a very, very weak voice, I says, Mac, I'm here, I'm alive, I'm here. So you can imagine, we were both crying and, and now I'm alive. According to the Germans, I was there. But 80, all the 87 people have been killed. So there was no ration for me, there was no food. A little in the camp was a Jewish police. There were the Germans, there were Jewish police. 
one of the policemen came in during the day in the block, and he says, you got to come with me. I says, where are you taking me? He says, I'm taking you back to Barak 5. His name was Abraham Vilcek. I says, Abraham, you, you're taking me back. You know what's going to happen again. I was lucky once. I won't be lucky twice. You know that the same thing is going to happen. As soon as there's some people there, or maybe now Altaf will come in right away and, and, he shoot, and he'll kill me. He says, look, you can't stay here because you're still sick and you might inflict other people in the same barrack. I'm going to place you in the quarantine, but I promise that I will watch over you. I will make sure that you will get your ration, that you get some food, and if I hear that there's somebody going on, something going on in the camp that might be a selection or something, I will take you out from there. And he kept his word. He brought to me every day food and he was watching. I, I got to back up a little, I should have mentioned that before, when I was placed to work in the Gestapo, when I came there, there were two Jewish girls working, two sisters, in the kitchen of the Gestapo. I didn't know them. They were from a different city. I never saw them, I never knew them. And, um, and they were also one of them during this election was placed in the camp and she was placed in the kitchen, in the camp kitchen. When she, so that's all I knew her from working there. When she heard that what happened to me and that now I don't get no ration, no food, she didn't know about the arrangements with the policeman. She was stealing food from the kitchen. You know, men and the women barracks were separated. So uh, she brought the food to the wires and then when the guards did not see, she would put it under the wire. My brother would pick it up and bring it to me. And that's how I got a little food. Uh, first of all, what is your brother's name? Mac and the other one was Aaron. And do you remember the name of the little girl, the girl who helped smuggle food out for you? Do I? Mm -hmm. Do I? Do you? She's my wife now, but I'm going ahead of her. Wow. Well, let's, let's get back to Barracks 5 here. So I was placed in Barrack 5, and she was stealing food and bringing it to me. And uh, then we were transported in 1944. The Russian army was moving into Poland. Uh, the Allied armies landed in, in Normandy. And so uh, the Russians were moving in Poland, so they shipped us to first to, a, to Stuttgart. To, I mean, I'm sorry, to Auschwitz because now uh, we weren't needed anymore, and Auschwitz, you know, was the final destination. Auschwitz was nothing but a slaughterhouse. And um, so they sent us to Auschwitz, and she was in Auschwitz too, but of course at the women's camp, and I was at the, at the men's camp. But sometimes by coincidence, when the Groups were working, walking out to work. I could just see it, just taking a glance, but uh, not very much. Then came, then we were shipped out from Auschwitz. The Russian army were moving in in 1944, and I was sent to another camp in Stutthof, which is near Gdansk. From there, we were. Uh, slaver and laborers were needed in Germany. You know, the young men and women were in the military, and Hitler promised uh, the people that they still win the war, that he's working on a secret weapon, and so, and they needed the, sl the slave laborers. So I was sent to Germany uh, near Stuttgart at an airfield, and. Uh, place called, called Talfingen, 
and we were building a highway to the airfield, expanding the airfield because the Germans were stationing their night fighters for the protection of Stuttgart. And so I was there, and then 19. 45, the American planes came, destroyed the camp, destroyed the barracks, destroyed everything. And we were shipped now further south, where the Germans were building a factory and from oil, throwing oil from, from shells, from, from rocks. We're doing it here now, very on a large scale. Uh, and so I was working there. And then again, the American planes came, and by then the German Air Force was not existing anymore. They were flying so low. As a matter of fact, in that bar, in that, on that airfield, one Sunday on a sunny, nice sunny day, uh, there were so many planes in the air that it was kind of dark. Uh, they, afterwards we heard there was a thousand or what American planes. Uh, I, a unit broke away from that large group and came down over the airport. And the, as they were coming down, you could see the insignia and even the number of the plane. You could see the airmen. That's how low they came down. And so all of a sudden there was a screaming in the barrack, everybody out, everybody out. There's Jewish planes here. They're going to pick us up. So we said, Jewish planes? Where have the Jews got planes? They haven't got shoes. Where have they got planes? So it was, you know, the American plane, you know, the Jewish uh, insignia, the Star of David, has got six points. The American has got five. But we didn't know at that time. We never saw American planes before. So we didn't know what the insignia was. So a star, a blue, white, white, you know, the plane are grayish, bluish, and the, with a star, so it's Jewish planes. Well, they came down, they destroyed the uh, airfield and all the German planes that were staying there, and um, so we weren't needed anymore, so we were shipped down further down south. We were working, like I said, in that uh, factory producing oil. And so the Americans came and destroyed that factory, and we weren't needed anymore. And that was April 1945. And so now an order came from Himmler that no prisoners from the concentration camp should, should fall into the Allied hands. They all got to be destroyed. And so we were placed on the Dead March. You must have heard about the Dead March. The Dead March, and we were walking for two days, on, um, two on the third day of the liberation, uh, walking to a, that we found out afterwards, to the destination was uh, South Tyrol, where there were abundant salt mines. And we were to be placed in the salt mines, and they are destroyed. During the day, they were walking us, but they, would, they were afraid to walk us at night because everything was darked out. And so they were afraid we might try to fight the guides or run away or whatever. So the first night, they put us in a barn, a huge barn. And in the middle of the day, once everybody was in the barn, we could hear arguments outside between the guards. Now, some guards, took gasoline and poured around the barn, and they were going to light up burn the barns and burn us alive in that, in that barn. There were another group that realized that saw what's happening because we could see already the fighting. We could hear the artillery shots at night. You could see the fires from the artillery. They knew that the Allies are close and that they will come and they might be caught, and then they will held responsible for what they did. So they said, we have our orders are to bring them wherever, and that's what we're going to do. And so that, that group prevailed. They took us out in the morning from the barn, and we were marching. The next day, 
we came to a bridge over a river. And although by then, there was no place to go. We were actually walking around in circles. There was no, no place where they could, where they, to bring us. Although their destination was South Tyrol, the salt mines. So we came and there was a bridge and we were going to cross the bridge, but there were already German engineers that were dynamiting the bridge to blow it up so that the Americans cannot cross the bridge. So uh, they said, uh, the engineers said to the guards, you can't take them across, the Allies are already on the other side. What we can do is place them on the bridge, and we're going to dynamite and blow the bridge so we can blow them up and they will wind up in the river, and that's it. So again, the, the those that said no, and they prevailed. And so on the third day, in the middle of the highway, in the Black Forest, if you ever had the Black Forest, right in the middle of the highway, we were liberated by the first French army. Describe a little more about that day. Uh, were the French just coming up the road with rifles in hand? No. No. We were walking and on one side, on the other side, the German army was running, not walking, but running back from the front lines. And we were walking, walking towards. Uh, down the, the leader of the guards called uh, the together, and he said to us, for the first time in five and a half years, that they want, that ordered us to sit in the wayside. He says, you are tired, uh, the guards are tired, we, there's a village ahead of us, we're gonna go there to refresh and clean up. I order you to sit in the, by the wayside and we come back and we'll pick you up and we'll continue the march. The first time in five and a half years that they were worried about us, that we're tired and let us sit unguarded. We're such an important uh, thing, items to them that they never left us unguarded. God forbid if somebody would do some harm to us and then all of a sudden they left us unguarded. Well, of course, we knew already what's happening. So we didn't wait very long. As soon as they marched off, we just took in to run into the forest. It was right the highway through the forest. Although some people were killed because they ran right into the path of the returning German army. And they saw people in striped uniforms. They didn't even know where they were running to them but so some people got killed. I just ran, I didn't look, I didn't stop, I ran, just ran through their ranks into the forest, and I tried to get in as far and as deep in the forest as I could, which I did. Then I joined up with some other, there were five, four other boys, so there were five of us. We joined up, we got together. It was April, it was cold, it was still cold, at night, uh, so we got to sit through the night. So and we find a very thick brush uh, of underbrush of uh, in the forest, and we sat together to heat from your body heat to keep us warm for the night. In the morning, we heard a lot of noise going down on the highway from which we came but we didn't know what it was. We were afraid to go down to the highway to check the sea. So one of our boys volunteered. He went down to the highway, crawled down to the highway. After a while, he came back like Santa Claus with a blanket on his back with all kinds of goodies. And he says, right at the edge here of the forest on the highway, there is a military truck turned over and there was all kinds of chocolates and food and everything there. So uh, he didn't know what kind it's there, it's food. 
he brought, we had a fiesta, we sat down, we uh, ate, and then we went um, from the, uh, and he says, yeah, the Allies are here. He said the Americans, because it was the French Free Army, but they were out there were in American tanks, there were in American ships, they were wearing American uniforms. Uh, you know, they didn't have nothing. They were, they were themselves but liberated mm -hmm. by the Americans. So we went on. They picked us up on uh, on ships, on tanks, whatever, and took us into the nearest city, which was Sigmaringen. Sigmaringen. Mm -hmm. Sigmaringen. And evidently the French by then had a little experience, they must have all the way from France into Germany liberated camps because it didn't take long in a field kitchen came up and some nurses and doctors and they cooked and so we got food from them and, uh, and they placed us in a, a German school, you know, there was, there was no school so they placed us in the school, and we were there one or two, two days, and then they started to locate us with German families. So myself and another boy were placed with a German family. They had to take care of us, uh, give us food, and uh, uh, give, take, take care of us in general, whatever we need. Mm -hmm. There were quite a few people that were in the village divided in the German families. The first few days, I was numb. I didn't, I didn't understand what's happening here. For five and a half years, I was a slave. I was to do at orders. I was told when to get, go to sleep, when to get up, or when to eat when not to eat, when to go to the bathroom, excuse me. Uh, and uh, everything was on orders. And here, I can see that the, I can sleep when I sleep and I get up and, and, and everything. And nobody's guarding me with a rifle. Nobody's beating me now. For a few days, I wasn't beaten by anybody. So the first few days, I didn't comprehend what's going on. I didn't understand what's happening here. But then one day, you know, within time, it clears up. And, uh, and one day I got up and I said, uh, who am I? What am I doing here? Who am I? I have no name. I have a number. I don't know whether you have a So the number. I have a number. I have no name. Uh, who am I? Where, are my, where is my family? Uh, where am I going to go? I have no education. I have no, um, no, uh, 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 you know, uh, knowledge of work. Uh, look for the right name. What am I going to do? Where am I going to go? Where is my family? Is this going to be my future? Am I always going to stay live here with the Germans? And I said no. And so one day I broke down terrible. I was crying hysterical. My friends, oh, I had no profession. I have no education, no profession. And so I broke down and I was crying hysterical. My friends thought that I got a nervous breakdown. And I was screaming and, um, and I says, I'm not gonna stay here. I'm going, I'm going out in the world to look for family. Imagine, I was 20 years old then, but I was only 14. My life was interrupted at the age of 14. My education, my upbringing, my being with my family. You know, as a 14 year old, that depends on the family, on the mother, the father, the, with the upbringing, with the things that a teenager need. And here there is nobody to speak to. And so, um, so I just said, I'm gonna go out and look 
for my family. Maybe somebody's alive. Can imagine the imagination in the mind. You're going. I haven't got two cents in my pocket. I have no papers. I'm walking. Where can you walk? Where can you go? But I walked. I says, I'm just going to walk in the world and look for if somebody from my family survived. I walked a while, a little while, and I walked by near the house, and there was a garage. And the garage was a little ajar, open a little. And so I was curious, and I looked into the garage, and I saw there is a nice motorcycle stand there. So I was curious, I went in, and I saw the key was still in the motorcycle. I opened up the tank, the tank was full of gasoline. I says, the German population, the civilian public don't get any gasoline, because the Germans didn't have any gasoline themselves. Everything was for the military, all for the members of the Nazi party. I says, if there is a motorcycle with a key in it and full of gasoline, it must belong to a high-ranking Nazi. And I says, I wouldn't be a bit surprised that he lives upstairs over that garage. And he looks now from behind the curtain what I'm doing. And so I says to myself, if it is a high-ranking Nazi, he won't mind if I'll borrow that motorcycle. And that's what I did. I borrowed that motorcycle. I never owned a motorcycle. I never sat on a motorcycle. I was never driving a motorcycle. But I said, this is my lifeline. This can take me someplace. So I took it out from the garage. I didn't know. I, I'm 90 years old now, 70 years after the liberation. And I still don't know whether I started on first second or third speed or reverse. I didn't know that there is such thing as first, second. I just thought, I just, all I knew is when you turn the keys and go <laughs> and the motorcycle will take off. And that's what it did. But it threw me off like a bronco, it threw me off. I cut my knees, I cut my pants, but I didn't give up because like I said, this is my lifeline. I got again on, I went back on the motorcycle did the same thing. On the third time, it took off. And again, I did not, I don't know up till today whether I went in reverse, or second, first, third speed. That's all. It was going. It was going, and so I uh, ran on, went on that motorcycle, but not very far, because you know by then, Germany had three zones of occupation, the American, the British, French, and Russian. And when I came to the border of the American, I was now in the French zone of occupation, I came to the American border, I was arrested by the MPs. MPs arrested me, and they took me to Stuttgart, and took me there to the, into the headquarters of the General Eisenhower headquarters. Stuttgart was pretty badly bombed. But this was one of the nicest and biggest building. Maybe it was the building belonging to the Gestapo before, but it was General Eisenhower's headquarters in, in Stuttgart. So they took me in there, and the uh, uh, MPs were wearing uh, uh, fatigue uniforms. They set me down on a table, and they started to interrogate me. Who are you? Where are you going? Uh, because the war was still on. In this part, the French were ready, but there was still other part. The war was still going on. It was April. And so what are you doing? Where am I? They thought maybe I'm a spy. And I knew just three, three things. I was liberated from a concentration camp. I borrowed that motorcycle. I didn't want to use the word stall. I borrowed the motorcycle, and I'm out looking for family. And you know how interrogators are. Before one finishes, the other started to confuse you. But that's all I could say is those three things. There was nothing else I could say because there wasn't anything else. Finally, they left me sitting there. Then another man came in, an officer. While they, these two were wearing fatigues, 
it, that man was wearing a uniform, an officer's uniform, you know, an, an Eisenhower jacket and a uh, not the dark green, but uh, kind of grayish pants and a green shirt with a tie. And he sat down and he started to ask me. And I said uh, the same thing. After a while, he says, I believe you. The biggest mistake I met at that time and there that I didn't ask what that man did for me, that I didn't ask him where he's from, his name and where he's from, but who at that moment was thinking that I'm gonna wind up in America. Today, if I know where that man is, or where he lives, I would walk across America because you'll find out what it did for me. <laughs> so, but at that time, I didn't think of it. He says, come with me. He took me in an in a area. There was a, a, a bath, a shower room. He says, go in there, take a shower, which I, uh, at home, of course, we didn't have no showers either. And uh, he says, put the clothes here. When I came out, my clothes were gone. They probably burned it. There were some civilian clothes there waiting for me. I put this on. He says, come with me to another room. I came into a room and there was a table with a white tablecloth and food on it. It's something that I never saw before. I, the only thing I tried but I couldn't eat was the dish that was in. That's how hungry I was. And, uh, because my, under that much, we were not getting any food. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're going to be killed now, so why should they give us any food? I ate uh, that, and I said, I'm going to give you papers signed by General Eisenhower that were that you looking out looking for family. Uh, they, during the war was still on, like I said, and so they were military units, American units, stationed every place over the highway, in forests, and or whatever. So wherever you will travel and you will stop by American unit, you'll show them the papers, they will give you gasoline, they'll give you food, and they'll give you protection, which I did. Izzy, be they, uh, before you continue, I'm just kind of curious, um, when you were encountering the Americans, were you speaking in English or Polish or? I didn't know, no, German. Uh-huh, okay. I spoke German, and they spoke, they were intelligence. Oh, okay. And intelligence, they had to speak uh, German, you know, to interrogate Germans. Okay, so I'll let you go to back on the road. So, uh, and then, so when I left there at the headquarters, I found out that in the, right after deliberation, the camps, there were camps in Stuttgart and around Stuttgart, and the people that came out from the camps had no place to go. So they were laying, sleeping in parks, sleeping in, in the ha uh, you know, streets, uh, doorways. And uh, General, Eisenhower, General Eisenhower saw that. And he says, that's ex unacceptable. Stuttgart, like I said before, was pretty much bombed. He ordered his uh, assistants to find a place, a part of Stuttgart, which is not bomb. They found West Stuttgart. And so Eisenhower ordered that the people, the German people that lived in those streets, which was Bismarckstrasse, Rheinsburgstrasse, be emptied of the Germans and that the Holocaust survivors be placed in those, in those buildings. Which, would ha which happened. And then there was a committee set up there, a Jewish committee. So I went into the committee and said, well, maybe, maybe they know something about my brother. And when you come in the committee, you registered, not only from this camp, but from other DP camps. My name is Arbeit, that starts with an A. So there was a big wall, and there were names I take a look on the town, is my younger brother's name at top of the list, that he survived and that he's in a DP camp named Munich in Fedlachingen. 
So you can imagine the joy that my younger brother survived and he's there. So I said I'm gonna go right away and pick him up. At the same time, a girl comes over to me and says, you remember you were in that camp and there was a girl that helped you with food when you were sick, helped you with food. She survived, she's alive in Bergen-Belsen, that's near, near Hanover. Oh, I says, well, that's very nice. And I said to her, are you gonna see her again? She says, yes, as a matter of fact, tomorrow I'm going back to, to that camp, to Bergen-Belsen. I says, please do me a favor, when you see that girl, tell her that I survived, that I'm alive, and I think very much, thank her very much for what she did to me, for me. She says, I'll do that. But then later on, I said to myself, Izzy, that was wrong what you just did. That girl did so much for you. She actually saved your life. The, le the least thing you could do is go over there and say thank you to her yourself. I said, that's a good idea. Here I'm talking to myself. I checked with my secretary. I had no special appointments the next day. You know, special appointments the next day. High ranking appointments. So I said, I have a motorcycle, I have gasoline. I'm gonna pick up first my brother in Munich, in Munich and then I'm gonna go and say, see this girl and say thank you to her. I, when I came to Munich to pick up my, in fact, I think I pick up my younger brother, there was a friend of mine from the city that I come, and he said, you know, your older brother, Mac, is alive. He is in Italy, in a place called Bari. Bari was a transit camp. He's preparing there to go to with the illegal emigration to Palestine. There was no Israel yet to Palestine. And I'm working for the, for the Bricha, that was the underground organization that are transporting people from the DP camps to Palestine. Of course, the British intercepted them and took them to uh, uh, Cyprus, to camps in Cyprus. But those that could get through wind up in, in Palestine. So I says to him, Alex, please do me a favor. Uh, if you'll see him again, he says, yeah, I'm going to see him because I'm taking a group of people tonight. I said, do me a favor, then you'll see my brother. Tell him not to go no place, to wait until the three of us will get together and then we'll decide what to do, where, where we should go. So he did it, and my brother now stayed and go stayed in Bari. So now I got the, my younger brother with me. So the next day I'm taking the motorcycle and I go to, it's uh, about from Stuttgart. They said from Stuttgart to, to Hamburg to, is probably about close to a thousand kilometers. But I was young, I uh, had the, everything on the papers, whatever I needed. And so I went to Bergen-Belsen. When I came there, that Bergen-Belsen was in, it's the British zone. Uh, they were still in the camp and it was locked up. They couldn't get out. Nobody could get in and they couldn't get out. There were armored guards near the, the doors. Here I came out of there with civilian clothes, with a motorcycle hat and those big glasses. And so I showed the guard the papers from General Eisenhower. They opened the door, let me in. I came in, I found out where she is, and uh, I came there in that room. Uh, there were five girls in the room, which isn't much bigger than this area over here. Of course, she was very happy to see me. I was very happy to see her. And for the record, what was the, what's the girl's name who later became your wife? Uh, now or then? Then. Then it was Hanka, C-H-A-N-K-A, Walter, mm -hmm. B-A, 
L T E R. And I saw Akimi, she was very happy to see me. Of course, I was very happy to see her. And um, they couldn't get out from the camp. But during the day, there was there's an oval, and people were walking. So during the day, I said to her, would you, I see people are walking, would you like to go down for a walk with me? And she said, yes, I would like to go down, but you see, there is five people living here in this room. And we, among the five of us, we have only one pair of shoes. And today is not my day to wear the shoes. So I says, okay, show me which girl is today to wear the shoes. I went over, I begged, I bribed her. She gave this girl the shoes. We went up for a ride on a motorcycle and everybody there, who is this man? Here, we can't get out from the camp. He's on a motorcycle, dressed, but um, who is he? Anyways, uh, one day and I says, I'm not gonna stay here just that day. Tomorrow I'm leaving. I'm going back tomorrow. Here, you're still locked up. To the, over there, I'm in the American zone, and you're the American, it's the American. There's plenty of food, and there is freedom, and uh, we're free already. You're still in prison. So, uh, but comes in the evening and I ask, is there a hotel or a motel someplace where I can go uh, to sleep over the night? And they say there is no hotel or motel. And so the five girls get together and they have a conference. You know, there's always a leader, whether it's an organization, a school or whatever, there is a leader. The oldest one is a leader. And this, and this girl, the oldest one, says to the other four, I don't like this guy. He's a Casanova. He didn't come here to say to you, thank you. He came here for something else. So uh, he cannot stay here. He cannot stay in this room during the night. So, but the girl say, what are we going to do with him? It's cold out. We can put him in the street. He's got to sleep someplace. Yeah, let him worry, let him sleep in every room, but not here. I don't like this guy. I don't trust him, you know. So they say, okay, but he's got to sleep someplace. So finally they convinced them, and she said, okay, he can sleep here, but not with the girls in the bunks, on the floor, on the Bay of Woods. So they tell me, okay, you can sleep here, but on the Bay of Woods, Bay of Floors. So I says to myself, I slept for five, five and a half years on the Bay of Woods. One more night isn't gonna kill me, and tomorrow I'm out of here. So I lay down in my clothes, no pillow, no blanket, just like that. This girl took a chair, put it near my head, and she was sitting there the whole night watching me. God forbid I shouldn't, I shouldn't move. Thank God I had a strong blood there. I didn't have to move. I went through the night and in the morning I say uh, to that girl that I came to, to hunk about there, eh? I says, I'm going back to the American zone. And yeah, first of all, I look out the window, my motorcycle is gone. It's not there. So they figure who could have taken it? The British, the British had a office in there. I says, if it's the British, it's all right. So I went there, showed them my uh, papers from General Eisenhower, they gave me right back the motorcycle. Okay. So now I says, I'm leaving, going back there. If you wanna go to the American zone, I will gladly take you with me. So that girl again organizes all the others and they all now get against me. Don't go with him. Don't trust this guy. He's going to use you and then, and then leave you. Uh, stay here with us. You know, I'm still, this is now 70 years later. I'm looking for those girls so I can tell them that we are Observe, gonna observe now the 68, nine, the 69th uh, um, uh, 
anniversary that we have and I'm proud patriarch of the four generations of the Arbeiter family. We have three children, three grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren, and we're still happily married, ha happily married. Can't find any of them. So, so that's what it is, and then um, we came to Stuttgart. We got a little apartment, and, uh, and so she was living in her apartment. I had mine. But you know, living in the same city now, uh, we used to see her more often when we started to date. And then in uh, 1946, I proposed to her, we got married. In 1948, November of 1948, our daughter number one was born in Stuttgart. And uh, now in the, the P camps, uh, organizations from the United States opened offices. And they announced if there are any people in the, the P camps that have relatives in the Western countries, that they should come in and register so that we can we can, con uh, you know, establish contact between them. So I did the work. They joined the Hayas, the um, uh, whatever organizations. I registered that I, my mother had two sisters and a brother living in this country. They came here at the turn of the century, during the Industrial Revolution. See, in the family, in the Klein family, that you were talking before, mm -hmm. there were three girls and a boy. At that time, you didn't need any visas or anything. You just come, you just, if you could uh, muster a uh, transport money for come by ship, they, uh, you could come to America. So two, came to America, the two girls and the boy. My mother was the youngest from the girls. She could also have gone to America, but she sacrificed herself. She said she doesn't want to live, ha leave her elderly parents by themselves. So she will stay until they move on and then she'll come to America. In the meantime, World War II broke out she couldn't go anymore, and she was murdered in the death camps of Treblinka. How did you find out what had happened to your parents and uh, younger brother? In the camps, in the camps, there were um, Jewish police, and the, the and the police every now and then was with one or two policemen go with a truck to the death camp, St. Treblinka, to bring clothes, shoes, uh, whatever, from the people that, that, that were murdered there and brought to the camp for the people, for the slave laborers to wear. When they came in a death camp, there was still what was called a Sunday commando, a special commando that were working the guest chambers, the crematoriums, and um, they were telling the policemen that the, this is clause from the people, say from Starachowice. So they were told that all the people that came with that transport were all murdered. So the policemen that came back and told us that all the people from Starachowice were murdered in Treblinka. So that's what we know at that time. Uh, we went by that until after the liberation, you will find out exactly where the people were taking from Starkovice to Treblinka and they murdered. Mm -hmm. All right, Izzy, let's get you back to Stuttgart a little bit. Uh, the war is just about over at this point. You're a soon to be wife, I hope, yeah. is, still, is still now in Stuttgart. And you have registered 
to help uh, not, not to get in touch with your parents, uh, I'm sorry, yep. your relatives in the United States. So my aunt, my aunt, uh, one of my mother's sisters, uh, mm -hmm. they were both living here in Boston, in uh, the Roxbury section of Boston. My uncle enlisted in World War I. He served in the Army, and then coming back from the Army, he got a piece of land uh, homesteading upstate New York, and uh, he settled there. I knew the address of my, the name and the address of my aunt because the correspondence. And you know, to us, it was the rich aunts in America. It's like today with the people from Mexico or from other countries that come and work and save a little money to send home to their families. And so it was that the, the daughters here working saved and so sending for the elderly parents. So we knew they were living on the money that their children were sending them from America. Uh, and so I knew the address, the name and the address, and I told this in the bureau. And the day, of course, contacted and I pretty soon I got a letter from, from America from my aunt that she was very happy that three of us survived although of course she was very uh, very sad that her sister her brother-in-law uh, they, they perished and she started to send right away to us uh, packages clothing packages and food packages she couldn't send any money we were not allowed to have any money or gold, but uh, food and clothing was very important. And she said that she was working for me to uh, come to America. Between the three of us, I was her favorite. So I was first to come to America, and she was working out papers for me. Fine, I was very happy. Then in 48, was when it was already close to come to America. Yes, I had to let her know that there isn't, it isn't just me now, that mm -hmm. there is three people. I was afraid she's gonna send the papers for me and I, I would not leave my wife and a baby and the others can't go. So I wrote to my aunt, that I found a nice girl and I got married and we have a child and I got back a letter from my aunt that she disowns me. She doesn't want to hear from me, she doesn't want to know me, I should never write again to her, I, I'm out of the picture. What happened? Uh, you know, during the war, the men were in the military, and there was anyways a more women in, the, in America than the young men. My aunt was, I find out later, she was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful person. But she had in her mind that she's gonna be now the most popular person, if not in America, then at least in Massachusetts. She belonged to a women's club. Now she's bringing to America three young, handsome boys. For that the women in her club will break down her door to get one of those boys for their daughters. Holy matchmaker, Batman. <laughs> so, so, I'm out of the picture. She doesn't send anything, she doesn't want to know me. She got the papers to my brother, to my younger brother, and so instead of me coming, he came in 1948. But she didn't stop. My brother came, she didn't stop. Why did Izzy do that to me? I had such great place for her, such great plans for him. And she says, Susan's father owned the John Hancock building and a fleet of airplanes. Mary's father owned the uh, uh, 
behalf of uh, of Boston, you know, I'm just thrown out. And uh, these girls, I mean, the, white, the women had their girls prepared for the camp for the handsome boys, and that I could have been safe for the rest of my life. I wouldn't have to work, and, and here I took a poor girl that doesn't even have a, poor, a pair of shoes. What kind of a man is he? Why did he do this to me? I had such great, great plans for him. So my brother says, Auntie, when you will see Izzy and his uh, wife and the baby, you will change your mind. She says, no, never, never, because that's what it did to me. I, I, again, I had such great plans. So, okay, but after a while, she changed her mind and she worked out papers for the three of us. We came and let me tell you, a mother can be so good to her children as my aunt was to us. She did so much for us, it's, it's unbelievable. And, um, and it was not only she passed away now, but the cousins and members of the family are still very close with us. As a matter of fact, we have one cousin that does every year, the day after Thanksgiving, she makes a family brunch and inviting cousins, second cousin, third cousin, fifth cousins, and we meet in her house. By then, there is second, third, and fourth generations, and um, that's how close we were, and that's how close we are. All right, and, Izzy, you're, you're, you and your young family are now in America. Yeah. What was it like that first day when you stepped off the, the boat? Un, unexplainable, unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Because this is now a dream since childhood. In our family, it's nothing that you were talk more about than America, that my mother's sisters in America. Uh, that we'll wind up in America and how good America is in America. It's the gold uh, money link in the street. You just got to know how to pick it up. And, uh, you know, all the beautiful, all the good things and that we will someday wind up there and be part of that. And that was always, whenever a, a letter came from America, you know, the whole family would sit around and, and my mother would read it and... Um, just like if we were, if we were there. I, I remember when they were, um, what was the name? Hamel, the skating champion, Hamel. Oh, Dorothy Hamel. Dorothy Hamel. We didn't know, but we heard about that. And so it's maybe it's our cousin, maybe it's a relative. So we always trying to connect with somebody in America. It was the greatness and the beauty and, uh, and um, what can I tell you? It was the dreams, the future, because Poland was a poor country. And, um, and the Jewish people didn't have much of a choice of advancing. You could be the tailor, a shoemaker, or a cap maker, or a carpenter, something. There were a few rich people too, I mean, but the majority were, were hard-working poor people that worked the whole week and didn't have uh, for the Sabbath uh, money to buy things for the Sabbath. It's just a poor country and the discrimination. Number one, Jews couldn't get uh, a guy uh, get into higher education. If somebody finished high school, he was already an educated person. Uh, to the universities, very, very few were allowed to in the universities. And there were Jewish lawyers and Jewish doctors too, but not too many. So like I said, the chance of advancing wasn't too good. And so um, that was the, the future, the dream of coming to America. And when I came, when I came, uh, we came down on the, in 1949, 
on the uh, ship, uh, on a military transport ship, General House. Uh, at that time, there were the military transports that were bringing back the army from, uh, from Europe. And so we were brought on the transport ships. And uh, in Germany, into the P camps, they think the most exclusive thing was a Coca-Cola. You know, you could buy that in the stores, but it was the GIs, there was a black market. In the, G, in the uh, PX, it cost five cents. The GIs were selling it in the P camps of the black market for 50 cents. Big marker. So, but we couldn't afford it, we didn't have 50 cents. So a few of us would get together, this one a nickel, this one a dime, and there could have been five people drinking from the bottle. So we had the bottle, and you, were going, you got five cents, so you can drink this much up till here. <laughs> the other one got for 10 cents, you can drink up till here. <laughs> so so my, uh, my dream was I, I had a sip of Coca-Cola, participating with the other partners, but I never got the real taste of it because a little sip. Mm. So my dream was, look at, listen to this, my dream was to come to America, not to wind up on a, star, a skyscraper or be a millionaire, but to be able to have a bottle of Coca-Cola all by myself and drink it. This was my dream. And my brother was already here, and my aunt at the at the um, uh, Commonwealth Pier. I came, we came directly to Boston. And as we came up from the came out from the ship, and we were walking walking there to the car, and I was just looking around, and my brother says to me, he says, "Is he what's the matter? Something is wrong. You you don't feel good." And I said, "No." When I told him what it is, my what my dream is the first dream in America. He says, come with me. They were, I remember, uh, uh, what do you call? You put them, put in a coin. Oh, the vending machine? The shredding machine. Yep. You put in a nickel and a bottle of Coca-Cola. So my brother put in a nickel there, pushed a button and a Coca-Cola, bottle of Coca-Cola. And he says, he go ahead, take it, it's yours, you can drink the whole thing. And it was the first joy in America, having a bottle of Coca-Cola and drinking it all by myself. Wow. All right. You can, you can scratch the Coca-Cola off your list. Tell us what happened next. Uh, what did you do for work? Uh, were you living with your relatives in Roxbury? From there, we went to, my aunt took us to their house. <laughs> And then uh, we were living there. My brother was already living there. And now the three of us, so it was four in addition to us. She didn't have any children. This aunt didn't have any children. It was her and her husband. And now there's the four of us living mm -hmm. in, in the apartment. Three of us and my brother that was there already mm -hmm. from before. And she was... Uh, uh, supporting us in a way, you know, with food and, and uh, of course, to have to come here, you had to have to meet three criteria. S by some signed by somebody, living for this, uh, getting a job, and some not to be fall on the last of the government. At that time, there was no uh, welfare, which I wouldn't go on welfare anyways. I was living with my aunt for a, for the week, a week or two, and then I went to work in a clothing factory in uh, in Roxbury Crossing. There was a clothing factory. It was called the uh, Crimont Clothing Company. I got a job there. It was paying seventy five cents. An hour was the minimum wage. But it was all right. The first, uh, after the first uh, pay, 
I came home with a check of $14.63. Once I started to work, with the help of my aunt, we got an apartment in Dorchester near Franklin Park. And, uh, but now, with, uh, I couldn't even get 40 hours because the economy wasn't good and the priority of work, of jobs, and living was going to the GIs, rightly so, that came back from the, from the war. So I got about 20 hours a week. So that wasn't enough to support now three people. And we got an apartment on our own. So uh, uh, working in the factory, I said, uh, this is not going to be my future. I won't be able to accomplish anything by working here for 75 cents an hour. So the first things what I have to do is learn the language. If you learn the language, then you uh, can speak. You see, when I came here, I spoke a perfect English, perfect. Where did I learn it? On the boat, on the ship coming here. The sailors were uh, American sailors. So what I learned from them to say, okay. And I learned to say it with such a southern accent, okay. Whatever anybody said to me, I said, okay. Believe me, I didn't know what they were saying, what it is, but it was okay. I wouldn't be surprised that some people say, what kind of an idiot is that? I tell them something which is probably bad, and he says, okay, all right. But I said, uh, I gotta learn the language, and so I worked in the factory, I came home, ate dinner, and went to night school. I went to night school because that's why I speak much better English at night because I learned, I went to night school. You know, when you go to mm -hmm. night school, you learn better mm -hmm. to speak yeah. at night. So I uh, went to night school, I graduated there, and uh, now uh, the money, the, and then I came home. No, from the night school, there was in Grove Hall was a little tailor shop. An elderly man had a shop there. And so I went in and I said, whether can you help me? Can you give me some a job to do something? He says, yeah, I can get something for you to do. But you got to know that here, that they pay 75 cents an hour. I says, OK, I'm getting this in the factory. So here it's going to be 75 cents an hour. So comes Friday, he pays me, he pays me 50 cents an hour. So I says, we have an agreement. You told me you're going to pay me 75 cents an hour. So now he gives me a lecture on the Constitution. <laughs> he says, here in America, everybody pays taxes. And you got to pay taxes too. So the 25 cents go for taxes. Does anybody believe that he took the 25 cents and gave it to the government? It went from one pocket into the mm. other pocket. But I had no choice. I mm. needed it. So every night, at that time, the places were open till about 11, 12 o'clock. So from night school, I went to there. I worked for two hours. So I made another dollar an hour a day. Over the week, I got $5. And Saturday, I worked the whole day, 10 hours, because I didn't work in the factory. So I made another $5. So during the week, working nights, and Saturday, I made another $10. In the factory, I started to make a little more. And um, so it started to get a little easier. And um, after a year, after the first year, I said uh, to myself that this isn't going to take me too far with those 75 and 50 cents. I got to find something, something else business. And then there was, my aunt told me that there is a store 
the same kind that I'm helping this man out on in Dorchester on Talbot Avenue. So there was an elderly man that passed away and the estate is selling the store that goes into the estate. Okay, I went, I looked, I found out how much do they want for it? $500. To buy a business for $500 is not bad. Of course, it was an older man. He didn't do much business, but I got to start someplace. So now I went to the bank. It was a Shomut bank. I went to the bank and told the, the man that is in charge of the loan department that I'm buying a business, I'm going to become an entrepreneur, I'm going to get jobs, I'm going to jobs for other people, I'm going to build America, that's what I want. So he says, very nice, very good. Uh, how much is the business cost? I says, $500. He says, oh, that's not bad. So he says, what do you have for collateral? I says, a wife and a child. He says, that's not good for collateral. And they couldn't, and he wouldn't give me the loan. So I went back, and now I went to the family and borrowed five dollars here, ten dollars there. My brother was working, and he was single, so he saved up a few dollars. Well, anyways, I put together two hundred and fifty dollars. And so the family, the estate, took the balance, the mortgage of two hundred and fifty. I sunk, I gave him fifty percent. So they took a mortgage of the other 250 to be paid out during a year at $5 a week. I paid it up much sooner, and now I started the business, and uh, my brother and I were working, and uh, working late hours, and then started to get, we started to get busy. Now we hired some help already, we hired a presser, hired a, uh, counter girl, and so the business work it was getting good, and uh, and uh, we were happy to stay there. But then the area changed; uh, it became very bad, very dangerous to stay there. It was the time when Martin Luther King was uh, assassinated, and uh, they kept breaking in, breaking the windows. If, the, if I had to put crates on. So now they found that there is on the roof a skylight. They broke to the skylight. Uh, it, it was terrible. They were breaking. It was a danger to stay there. They were stealing uh, from the store. So now I, uh, we were told that there is a Newton available in a store. A man, uh, Mr. Kennedy, I uh, want to sell his business, and so um, I went there, I looked at it, and uh, it was very nice what I did see, and mm -hmm. I bought it in 15 minutes, because I saw that the possibilities there, that there is a great possibility. The man is a cleaner doing dry cleaning, very nice, but we were also tailors. And in the whole area, there is no tailors. And, uh, you know, people wear clothes. They need uh, alteration or whatever. And so we started to work tailoring, and it got very busy. We wind up employing six tailors. And the business was growing, and it was going very good. And then we bought a house in uh, Newton, not far from the, from the store. And so we had now, we had to get another store. One was become the tailor shop and one the cleaning store. In um, 1985, we sold the cleaning. Somebody came and made me an offer like the Godfather, you know. I couldn't refuse. And uh, so we sold the cleaning store and kept the tailor shop for another 10 years till 1995. Then we sold the tailor shop, and I said, it's time I retired. And since then, I'm retired. But um, in that time, of course, I was busy with a lot of other things with the organization uh, involved in 
uh, with the museum and uh, mm -hmm. a lot of speaking. And one of these organizations is the American Association of Jewish Holocaust Survivors of Greater Boston. Yes. Can you tell us more about that group? That group, I was the founder of that group in 1950. When we came, when we came to this country and we started to get together, our first pledge was that no matter what we'll do, we will have to remember the tragedy that befell our people and our families that were murdered in the, in the death camps. And so we decided first to have a, uh, a Holocaust Memorial observance. Every year at a certain day, I have an observance. Now that we uh, as, uh, had that decided, and we had, say, the first observance, uh, we were young, and we were circuit players from the old country, and so the young boys said, why don't we form a soccer club? Which we did. There was some uh, Boston Athletic Association, or whatever it's called, supplied us with uniforms and shoes, and so we played soccer for a while. We had a men's club, but then, but then there was most of us who were married. And I said, wait a minute, men's club, what about the women? What are we doing? We're just gonna watch you, watch what you're doing. And so we decided that the women always win so that there should be a family association, men and women. And since then we, uh, have every year the observance, the Holocaust Memorial Observance. To now it's called the Shoah Observance, which is being held at Fenuel Hall. We have uh, social events. As a matter of fact, this Sunday, we have a social event uh, for families. The families get together, we have a dinner, um, all generations. Uh, now it's called the American Association of Jewish Holocaust Survivors and their descendants. Because now the children and grandchildren, and we have the first generation and the uh, second generation and the three Gs, the third generation. And so the association is uh, existing, uh, we meeting. Uh, like I said, we have events, uh, social events, observances, we build Was it me? <laughs> we built a memorial first at um, <clears throat> Brandeis University, and then in Boston. If you ever really had a chance to see it <clears throat> on Congress Street, mm -hmm. back of Annual Hall, it's the big uh, memorial, the Six Towers, mm -hmm. of which we were leaders in the with the community and um, and now we are just uh, kind of sitting back like I'm retired now and have the generations the second the third generation continue with the work that we did okay. Izzy we're going to be wrapping up this interview is there anything else you'd like to say I just want to see in conclusion to thank you and everybody else that does that work by keeping the memory, that important part of life, of history alive. Uh, we won't be here forever. We're getting less and less and less. But if it's people like the museum here and you, what you're doing, and other groups that keeping the history of World War II the Holocaust, the Nazi era, the murder of six million of our people, men, women, and children. And if I were to go in detail with you about life in the concentration camps, the murder, what, how that was taking part, we would have to be here till tomorrow morning. 
at the very least. So I want to again thank you very much and everybody else. Well, Izzy, I have to thank you, uh, first of all, for surviving and for being so willing to speak out um, on the horrors of the Holocaust and still being active in this movement after seven decades. So on behalf of the Natick Veterans Oral History Project and the Museum of World War II Boston, we thank you, Izzy Arbeiter, for coming down and interviewing. We are at the Museum of World War II Boston and we're talking with Izzy Arbeiter, who is a survivor of the Holocaust and what you're seeing on his left arm is the tattoo of a number that was implanted on him by the Germans at Auschwitz. Izzy, take it away. Uh, like, uh, when did you get the number? And when, I, when, <clears throat> when I arrived in Auschwitz. You, you know, when we had our transports arrived every, uh, every day. As a matter of fact, when I was there in 1944, uh, 10,000 people, 10,000 people, men, women, and children, were murdered in Auschwitz. So every day when the transport did arrive, there was a selection. Again, like the young and those that according to uh, Dr. Mengelitz or the others who have performed the selection were capable of performing slave labor were placed on one side. The elderly and the young that according to them were not being able placed on another side those were taken straight to the guest chambers mm -hmm. and murdered there. Those that were selected to perform slave labor were tattooed. And is there any significance to those numbers? Yes. Uh, the first, uh, the study population in Auschwitz was about 200,000 people. That's the study population that were performing slave labor in the nearby factories. So it was 200, after the 200,000, they started with A. After A, they did B. And I think B was, I think, probably the last number because that was already the, then they had to evacuate the camp and because uh, the Russians came to. Okay, the so the, the, that's actually the A and the number goes that way. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. It's A18,651. I don't know if there's any way. You mean? Let me just adjust this. Like this. I'm getting there. Good. Okay, and that is A18,651. A? Thank you. You're welcome. And now, you were mentioning uh, back in 2012, was it? Yeah. You had a chance to visit uh, Poland and Germany. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little more about that. Uh, I was asked, I did speak here at the invitation of Ken, and I then did some more, some other speaking, and so mm -hmm. they I evidently approved of what I have to say mm -hmm. and one day they called me and said uh, uh, Tim Gray and John Alessandro who is a, mm -hmm. a member supporter of the museum that my story should not be wasted that they should be recorded and the best way to record it is to go to Poland and Germany and uh, uh, record it, make a picture, a movie out of it, a DVD. And so uh, we went, and we went to Poland, and we went to Auschwitz, and we went to Treblinka, where my parents were murdered, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then to Germany, and we made a movie, a DVD, DVD which is very popular. I spoke in Germany many a times, and uh, I was very uh, in demand there. We sold quite a few of them in 
Germany and, and also here. Um, I spoke at uh, Newton City Hall uh, twice, uh, a second for the second demand. The first time it was, the place was full, standing room only. Mm -hmm. And so the men that asked me whether I would come back for a second time, which I did. Mm -hmm. I uh, spoke at uh, Henskem Air Force Base, and I spoke at uh, schools and mm -hmm. colleges. I spoke at Harvard, at uh, BU, at uh, Northeastern, at uh, Brandeis. Uh, so Izzy, what was it like going back to those death camps? It was, uh, of course, it was very painful, very hard, especially being coming to Treblinka and knowing that this is the last time that I'll be there and uh, to know, see the place where my mother, my father, my brother, my brother were murdered and that there isn't even a grave but I, uh, there is a place where uh, there, they were in, in, in tar, uh, shoes and other parts of memorabilia from the people that were brought to Treblinka. I said the uh, prayer, the Kaddish uh, there, and, um, and of course we did some shooting, film shooting. And so that was, of course, that was a very sad and very tragic mm -hmm. uh, place for me. And then when we came to Auschwitz, where I was in prison, and then it came everything back, the memory, where uh, I was there before, during the imprisonment. And um, it, yeah. wasn't, it wasn't a pleasant thing. Mm -hmm. But I realize that it is important that I do it, just like I it find it's important that I do it here. It's because knowing that it's going to be used for educational purposes, for uh, people, especially young people, that want to learn and want to know about the Holocaust. Now, Izzy, right behind us is part of the Holocaust exhibit here at the Museum of World War II. Have you um, anything to say about that exhibit or the museum in general? Uh, yes, I've been here many, many times, and I was speaking here to groups, and I tell them that uh, the little that you see, this is me. I mean, it's not me in person, but I see what uh, this is what I looked in, in the concentration camps. And of course, Again, the story of life of five and a half years in six camps cannot be told in, 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 in half an hour or even in an hour. Okay. Izzy, thank you so much. You're very welcome.